A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 4. Lauren Spearer, born January 17, 1991, was a 20-year-old student at Indiana University when she disappeared on June 3, 2011. She had spent the evening at Kilroy's Sports Bar in Bloomington, Indiana, prior to her disappearance. Her case has received national press coverage and remains unsolved, even though she's presumed dead. And as I'm sure you all can imagine, her family and friends just want answers and closure. This case came at the request of an anonymous listener, and we intend to bring more awareness to those who may not have heard about it. With that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And A Nefarious Nightmare presents... To Bloom in Bloomington. What happened to Lauren Spearer? Before we jump into this case, I want to go ahead and have Courtney give a disclaimer, a little peek into her personal life as it were, because we want you to all see what she's been tackling. Courtney does the vast majority of the technical stuff behind these episodes and also works a full-time job, cares for my little spunky, wonderful, cute little niece, and has her husband that she also cares for. Courtney, please take the floor for a minute. (laughs) Yeah, she's cute, isn't she? I love her. And she knows she's cute. She's not even remotely humble about that. Um, so you guys, I really don't want to have to do this, but it just feels like the right thing to do. Um, I want you to know that Amanda and I are working diligently to get content and episodes out to you all, but I'm begging you all, please just understand and give us a little bit of grace if things end up being a little bit wonky for the next few weeks. You know, if you're a Patreon, you may have heard the Not So Nefarious Criminals episode that we did with Bob Mata of Defense Diaries, and there's a chance that you may have sensed that I was a bit off. In fact, you might have sensed that I've been a bit off for the past couple of months. I mean, I am always a little bit off. You know what? Anyways, to be transparent with you all, um, my husband and I have spent the past three years caregiving for my mother, who had a series of ailments. I mean, I could write a full book of what she had, but... One of those things was end-stage renal failure. Um, Back in September, she started dialysis, and as a result, she began deteriorating when that started. She even developed a somewhat rare and widely misunderstood condition, which is secondary to kidney failure, called calciphylaxis, which basically is necrosis of the tissue that doesn't heal, or in layman's terms, like imagine a brown recluse bite that goes untreated. So... She had that all over her fingers and her feet. Um, Amputation had been heavily discussed, but they weighed that carefully as amputation may not have healed properly. The best that can happen with calciphylaxis is they slow down the progression, but the wounds never heal. It's an extremely painful condition that is heartbreaking to watch. So from September on, she had been in and out of the hospital and rehab every month, only being home for maybe like a week or, you know, Whatever, so we would call another ambulance. Each month, we were calling an ambulance. So after Christmas in 2022, she started rapidly declining. And despite all of our best efforts, very sadly uh, passed away this past Friday, uh, February 17th. Um, It's been just over a week, and I'm still somewhat in shock. But all I can say is that I'm so grateful that my mom is just no longer in agony. And I'm positive that she's watching after my family. She loved this podcast and the many other podcasts that I turned her on to. She was the one that was like, I've never even heard of a podcast. Like back in my day, it was a radio broadcast, but she was very thankful that I turned her on to that. And I was thankful that I was able to. Um, So she definitely would want us to keep this going. So um, even though I saw this coming, eventually I didn't see it happening for at least another six months or so. So... 
as you all can imagine, probably, um, my own world has been turned upside down. So I appreciate your patience with us at this time as, you know, we're trying to pick up the pieces. And honestly, as much of an extroverted introvert as I am, if anyone has any hugs to offer, um, I'll, I'll gladly take them. We have donated her body to science with hopes that they can do more research on calciphylaxis as well as the various other conditions that she had. And potentially, hopefully they can save someone else's life. Once we receive her ashes, we will also scatter them in New Mexico because she wanted us all to go on a road trip to Albuquerque and New Mexico has always held a place in her heart. So please, our biggest ask is to um, just take care of yourselves, guys. Take care of your health. My mom has given me the gift of a massive wake up call as she was just 65 years young when she passed away. Watching her go through what she's gone through was beyond heartbreaking and traumatic. And honestly, um, I'm still processing it. But believe it or not, Amanda and I do care deeply for everyone. We wouldn't wish this even on our worst enemy. So please just uh, please take care of yourselves. And um, our apologies if things are a bit behind in the coming weeks. I concur with all of the above. Please take care of yourselves and please keep Courtney and her family in your thoughts. I love you, girl. Now, on to today's case. Lauren Spearer was born January 17, 1991, to Charlene and Robert Spearer in Scarsdale, New York. She graduated from Edgemont High School in 2009 and went on to attend Indiana University, where she was studying textiles merchandising. Spearer was active in the Jewish community at IU and had spent the previous spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund. She had met her boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, and her friend, Jay Rosenbaum, years earlier at Camp Tawanda, a summer camp in the mountain town of Honeysdale, Pennsylvania. There, she also met various other future IU students who later became Spears' circle of friends when she enrolled at IU in 2009. Jay Rosenbaum, Mike Beth and Corey Rossman were the last people to see Spearer alive before her disappearance, as per police reports and the woman's family. Surveillance video and witness accounts corroborate that Rossman was accompanying an paired Spearer from a popular bar to her apartment and then to his during the early morning hours of that fateful night. Spearer, a fashion merchandising major, was last seen leaving her Smallwood apartment complex with David Roan at around midnight. The two had gone to Rosenbaum's apartment, a place where other students had already gathered and were drinking. This next bit is going to be the timeline of Friday, June 3rd, 2011, when Lauren went missing. Witnesses reported that Lauren Spearer left her apartment with a friend named David Roan and went to Jay Rosenbaum's apartment. She was then seen entering Kilroy Sports Bar, she walked out of the bar and left her cell phone and shoes there. She and Rossman then walked to her apartment complex where a passerby noticed her level of inebriation and asked if she was okay. After she left the apartments, Spearer entered an alley and exited at 2.51 a.m. walking toward an empty lot. Her keys and purse were found along the route. They arrived at Rossman's apartment shortly afterwards, where Michael Beth, Rossman's roommate, was. Beth escorted Rossman to bed and tried to persuade Spearer to sleep over for her own safety, but she wanted to return to her own apartment. Beth then phoned Rosenbaum, wanting him to take care of Spearer. Rosenbaum observed a bruise under her eye and two calls were placed from his phone. At 4.30 a.m., Rosenbaum reported that Spearer left his apartment and was last seen headed south on College Avenue, barefoot, wearing black leggings and a white shirt. Several hours later, Wolf sent Spearer a text and received a reply from an employee at the bar, prompting him to report her missing. During this, after they had all returned to the Smallwood Apartments, an altercation occurred between Rossman and another student, Zachary Oaks. And according to Lauren's family, Oaks punched Rossman onto the floor, resulting in Rossman saying he lost his memory for the rest of the night. But Rossman's friend, Zoe Camp, told the paper, quote, He knows that he got into a fight with some of Jesse Wolf's friends in Smallwood. 
end quote. It's unclear what caused the fight, but the Spears were told that Oakes and others had ordered Rossman to bring Lauren to her room, which resulted in an exchange of ang angry words. Rob Spear believes that Oakes and the other boys had observed Lauren and Corey in a bad state and wanted Corey to take Lauren back to the apartment, leading to the altercation. Twelve minutes later is when Rossman and Lauren left the Smallwood apartment and walked through an alleyway en route to Rossman's apartment building. According to FoxNews.com, Rossman was seen carrying Lauren, who appeared to be unable to walk. Rob Spear, Lauren's father, had expressed doubt about Rossman's claim that he lost all his memory after being punched by Oaks, calling it a story of convenience. He further stated that the fact that Rossman was still able to get both him and Lauren back to his apartment after the incident at Smallwood indicates that he was not in as bad a shape as he claims. Mike Beth, Rossman's roommate, was said to have helped him to his bed. Mike then walked Lauren down the hallway to Rosenbaum's apartment, where he offered her a place to sleep on his couch. However, Lauren refused and instead walked home alone in the dark, barefoot and without her cell phone. The distance between the two apartments was approximately six minutes, according to the police. So Rob Spear, Lauren's father, expressed his doubt at how his daughter could have recovered from her state in such a short period of time, noting that it did not make sense to him. Rosenbaum reported to investigators that either Spearer or Roan had quote-unquote crushed up and snorted colopin, a drug used to treat seizures and panic attacks before heading to the first bar. He also believed that cocaine had been taken as well. However, Spearer's family and investigators have stated that they have no knowledge of her consuming cocaine. Witnesses have reported that Spearer was severely impaired, falling multiple times and hitting her head on the concrete. Spearer suffered from a heart condition called Long QT Syndrome, which presented no outward symptoms and was unknown to most people, including Spearer's family. It is unclear if Spearer's state that night was due to her having taken the drugs, if she was given a substance without her knowledge. Rossman and Rosenbaum have declined to comment when contacted by Fox News, and Mike Beth could not be reached. Rossman allegedly accused the media and Spearer's family of harassing him, but he denied making such statements to a local newspaper and accused the reporter of misidentifying himself. If Rosenbaum's story is accurate, Spearer was an ideal target for a predator looking to abduct a woman, according to Harkins. He stated that her petite size and condition made her a very vulnerable individual, thus making her an easy target for someone looking to commit such a crime. In August of 2011, a nine-day search was conducted in the Sycamore Ridge Landfill in Pimento, which is located south of Terre Haute. This landfill is where trash from Bloomington is taken after a stop at the transfer station. The search was conducted by the Bloomington Police Department, the Indiana University Police Department, and the FBI. Bloomington Police Captain Joe Qualters stated in a news release that no evidence related to the case was found during the nine days that law enforcement conducted the operation at Sycamore Ridge Landfill. By May 24th of 2013, Investigators had received 3,060 tips on the disappearance of Lauren, with 100 of them being received during the first half of 2013. One year after Lauren went missing, police and private investigators hired by Lauren's parents continued to investigate the statements and actions of her friends who interacted with her before her disappearance, refusing to take anyone at their word. Lead private investigator Bo Diatel, a former New York City detective, has had three investigators working on the case since September 2011 and as of late 2012. Bo said in one interview that the last thing we have is her allegedly, and we use the word allegedly, leaving that apartment. Though interviews with witnesses, family members, and the private investigators, a grim picture has been revealed about Spearer's state of mind that night, as well as the prevalence of drug use and excessive drinking in her social circle. Jesse Wolf, who is Lauren Spearer's boyfriend, 
did pass a privately administered lie detector test, but his parents have stated that they did not trust the Bloomington, Indiana police to administer a test and refused to allow it. In a telephone interview, the Wolves have also accused the Spears of being quote unquote liars and have suggested that Lauren's drug abuse is the cause of her disappearance. Alan Wolf also stated that Jesse was texting him from his house that night while a Knicks basketball playoff game was on TV. According to Alan, Jesse was texting back and forth with Lauren, and she had told him that she was home and going to sleep. He then texted her to call him if she woke up, and then he went to bed. But as we know, she didn't go to bed and rather went out. Alan Wolf says that his son has been cooperative with both police and the Spears, engaging in conversations with the parents without a lawyer present, and even meeting with the private investigators. However, Wolf also claimed that the Spears have not been honest about his son's level of cooperation, saying, quote, The Spears are coming out now telling lies. End quote. Nadine Wolf, Jesse's mother, has said that Jesse and Lauren met at a sleepaway camp in Pennsylvania, which we knew about, where Spear was asked to leave due to drug use. Wolf believes that her son was only guilty of taking care of Spear, who had some quote, serious drug issues and would often black out. She also said that he had been taking care of her for two years while she was in college, but the one night she went out without him cost her her life. The Bloomington Police Department has said little about the evidence that they have in the case of Lauren Spears' disappearance. A month after she went missing, a 34-year-old woman was reportedly attacked by an unknown man in the same area. Last April, A 23-year-old man was arrested for allegedly assaulting a young woman on a bike path near campus, but it's not known if the police are investigating any possible links between these cases. Spears' mother has not been contacted by the police about any potential connections to her daughter's disappearance. With no arrests or body recovered, the only memories the Spears have are of Lauren's vibrant personality and her love for music, sports, and fashion. In April 2015, the Bloomington police announced that they were investigating a possible link between the disappearance of Lauren Spear and the murder of another IU student, Hannah Wilson. Wilson had gone missing April 24th of 2015 after visiting Kilroy's, the same bar that Spear had visited the night that she disappeared. Wilson was last seen getting into a taxi in front of the bar and driving away. Her body was found the next morning in Brown County. A local man named Daniel Messel was arrested for the murder after his cell phone was discovered near the body. In 2015, private investigator Bo concluded that the two cases were unrelated and any similarities between the two cases were just coincidence. The Bloomington police said, quote, information continues to come in regarding Lauren's case and investigators diligently pursue the information with the same level of commitment as in the beginning. No amount of time passing will deter us from responsibility and we remain dedicated to Lauren's case." End quote. Then on January 28th, 2016, the FBI and other police agencies investigated a property in the 2900 block of Old Morgantown Road in Martinsville, approximately 20 miles north of Bloomington, and it was confirmed it was related to Lauren's case. The property was connected to Justin Wagers, who had previously been suspected of exposing himself to local women. Cadaver dogs were used to search the property and indicated potential evidence, prompting anthropologists to conduct a dig and sift dirt from the barn. However, nothing was found. Additionally, a white truck belonging to Wagers was towed from the property, but nothing ever came from this either. Charlene, Lauren's mother, fondly recalled one of her favorite memories, which was her last memory of her daughter, before she disappeared. She remembered how Lauren had come home to surprise her for Mother's Day, and how they had talked every single day. Charlene still speaks of how she can still hear Lauren's lovely voice. The Spears have been highly critical of Rossman and the other two men who were reportedly the last people to have been contacted with Lauren. Robert Spearer has publicly expressed his distrust of the three men, calling Rossman a quote-unquote liar and coward in an interview with the Journal News in April 2012. The Spears remain hopeful that they will eventually get the answers they seek, with Robert telling the Herald Times that he believes quote, someday, some weeks, things will change for us. 
end quote. And someone will have the strength to come forward. The family has created and maintained a website called findlauren.com in an effort to keep the search for their daughter alive. In 2013, the U.S. District Judge Tanya Walton Pratt ruled that the parents of Lauren could sue former IU students Jason Rosenbaum and Corey Rossman on counts alleging negligence and damages for providing drinks to someone who already was intoxicated. Pratt dismissed a third count alleging the two men were responsible for the loss of a child's services, as Spear was an adult when she disappeared. Now, the Spears did end up filing a lawsuit against the two men, Corey Rossman and Jason Rosenbaum, for failing to ensure the safe return of Lauren. According to the lawsuit, Rosenbaum provided alcoholic drinks at his apartment and Rossman did the same later at Kilroy's Sports Bar in Bloomington. The Spears alleged that the two men were negligent in not ensuring their daughter's safe return to her apartment. During one of the hearings, Judge Pratt dismissed Michael Beth from the case, ruling that he was not liable for his actions. According to the case, Beth had offered Lauren a place to sleep after her roommate, Rossman, had brought her to their apartment in an intoxicated state. When she refused, Michael Beth escorted her down the hall to Rosenbaum's apartment. The Spears have long held the belief that the men involved in their daughter's disappearance have not been fully cooperative with the investigators. They hope the lawsuit they have filed will force the men to answer questions under oath, providing more information about the case. Attorneys asked the judge in August to throw out the lawsuit, claiming that the men had no legal duty to watch over Lauren. Charlene expressed her disappointment after that hearing. She told the Journal News, It just doesn't seem right. It feels like we're still in the same place that we were. She went on to express her hope that the case will move forward, and that there will be a good outcome regarding the other two men. She concluded by saying, quote, We just hope that the case moves forward, and no matter what, we're not giving up. End quote. Robert and Charlene then sought out private cell phone and academic records that had nothing to do with her disappearance, according to court documents filed by the attorneys of Jason Rosenbaum and Corey Rossman. The Spearers issued subpoenas to Verizon and AT&T, Indiana University and other wireless phone service providers for information regarding Rosenbaum and Rossman that was unrelated to the case. In response, Rosenbaum and Rossman filed separate briefs asking the court to squash the subpoenas. The Spears requested cell phone records spanning 134 days before and after June 3rd of 2011. The Spears filed an appeal in 2014 in the 7th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, Three days after U.S. District Judge Tanya Walton Pratt ruled in favor of defendants Corey Rossman and Jason Rosenbaum. In her 20-page ruling, Judge Pratt expressed sympathy for the Spears, but stated that they had not presented sufficient evidence to prove that Rossman and Rosenbaum were at fault for their daughter's disappearance. In 2016, almost five years after Lauren disappeared, former FBI cold case agent Brad Garrett says after looking into ex-convicts, Indianapolis drug dealers, and members of a biker gang, they have now shifted their focus to whether something happened closer to home. This could include a party where Lauren may have continued her night of partying, and if students may have witnessed her die from a drug overdose and then disposed of her body. The team also tracked down a former classmate of hers who allegedly claimed to, quote, know the guys who did it, end quote. So there are a few theories flying around as to what happened to Lauren Spear that we know of. First, being people she knew or in her quote unquote circle. Second theory being a stranger likely cruising around Bloomington could have seen Lauren as the quote unquote ideal target for an abduction. On the night of her disappearance, a white truck was spotted on surveillance footage not far from where she was last seen, prompting the police to wonder if the vehicle could be involved. Garrett asked if the driver could have pulled over and talked Lauren into the vehicle in just a few seconds and then taken her to wherever. His research then led him to James McClish, an ex-convict who had been released from prison for assaulting his ex-wife and who drove a similar white truck. McClish was living in a halfway house only 10 minutes away from where Lauren had disappeared. When it came to questions about Lauren, McClish stuck to his denials, answering calmly and clearly he said he had nothing to do with Lauren's disappearance. They said it seemed like he was telling the truth and even saying, quote, I wish you guys the best of luck. I do, end quote. And the test was over. 
A third theory involves an Indiana motorcycle gang known as the Sons of Silence. They're known to be a new, brutal kind of mafia. The alleged link to the Spear case came in the form of tips about a former member of the group, Robert Strange, who goes by the name of Bo Dean. Strange does not have a criminal record, but he is well known to authorities as an enforcer of sorts who would take care of any problems within the gang. Garrett obtained an online message from one of Strange's relatives claiming that Strange shot Lauren in a dispute over drugs and money and then buried her on his property. However, based on Lauren's cell phone records, it was unlikely she had suspicious links to Indianapolis where she was supposedly taken. This led Garrett to believe that someone was trying to implicate Strange in Lauren's disappearance, even saying, quote, If you lead a life like Bo Dean has led, there's a lot of people that don't like you. Based on the facts that we have today, he's off my board. End quote. This third theory came from the Spears when they became desperate for answers. They turned to the private investigator firm, Bo Detail, and set up the website, findlauren.com, like we stated earlier. It was on this site that the family received a tip that the detective said may hold the best chance for an answer. This tip led them to Corey Hammersley, an inmate at Indiana State Prison. Corey was once a star student and athlete, but had gotten deep into the drug scene at Indiana University. One year after Lauren's disappearance, James had a mental breakdown and started shooting into a house and at the police, which earned him a 24-year prison sentence. While behind bars, another inmate alleged that he was playing cards with Hammersley when Lauren's photo came up on the television mounted to the wall. The inmate said that Hammersley immediately looked up at the TV and said, quote, Man, I knew the guys that did that. The inmate said that Hammersley told him a story about how Lauren died at a house party with a group of unidentified students saying that, quote, they were drinking and doing X. She OD'd and it scared them. They didn't know what to do with her and they took her down to the Ohio River and got rid of her or disposed of her body, end quote. Garrett said it was a theory that he took seriously. When he had learned from Lauren's parents that she had a heart condition that could have come into play during the night of partying, this made the theory even more convincing. James denied involvement and said he, quote, absolutely not, end quote, helped move her body. Unfortunately, the case of her disappearance remains unsolved to this day. Despite extensive searches, she has never been found, and no arrests have ever been made in connection with the case. Before we wrap today's episode up, please don't forget to join our Patreon for bonus content, such as our Not So Nefarious Criminals podcast. Each week we have a guest and we always forget that we have a guest, which is crazy, but at least we always talk about the National Day. Which is, of course, my favorite thing about that podcast, by the way. Always cracks me up. Yeah, because Not So Nefarious Criminals is strictly about the National Day, but Yeah, we talk about the lighter side of crime, you weirdo, such as Florida Man. But it's not just Florida Man. It's all kinds of crazy shit. I mean, I recently read about common and strange Facebook marketplace ads. Did you all know that there's a dryer lint fetish? The more you know. It's a great palate cleanser. The podcast, not the lint. You also get to hear archived content that we chose to take off of our public feed because... We're weenies. We will be at the 2023 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival in Austin, Texas, August 25th through 27th. Come see us and let's kick it. I personally cannot wait to see Bob Mata again. Oh, I, I agree. Um, I think CJ from Beyond the Rainbow and Autumn from Autumn's Oddities owe me a hug or 50, you know, because we all like elephants. We love elephants. And I believe that there will be Julie Mary, Tara Newell, and Collier Landry, to name a few, special guest appearances. Yes, there will be a ton of great people there, and you do not want to miss out. It's so much fun, and you get to be around advocates. Tickets are for sale at truecrimepodcastfestival.com. Make sure you use our code BEES, B-E-E-S, at checkout for 15% off your tickets and we will have stuff to give away. Unsolved cases that give a hint of an unfortunate result are never fun and always so frustrating. 
The family wants closure and answers. Law enforcement wants answers. And even though someone knows something, it's like poof, nobody knows anything. In a perfect world, we all have all the answers right in front of us, but this world is far from perfect. So then there's people like Amanda and I that utilize what we have to help spread awareness and advocate, which is our voices and platform. And at the end of the day, Lauren Spearer was and is a bee. Her family and friends are also bees. Just a reminder that bees are resilient, beautiful creatures who are beneficial to the world, but they are also vulnerable. With this knowledge, we must make damn sure that we protect the bees at all costs because bees are what makes all of us survive and thrive. So be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally recorded by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Finner and Amanda Cronin. This podcast is a Cloud 10 podcast managed by Sim Sarna, Sahiba Krieger, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. You can help us grow our show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. Thank you, and as always, be vigilant.